What's going on, family? I'm Scrapbook Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fistigov series. I want to talk about another conversation my dad and I had as we were sitting at the round table creating scrapbooks. We came across a man by the name of Jack Johnson. You know, the first black heavyweight champion in boxing history. Well, Jack Johnson has so many stories about him. You can never talk about him enough. He was born on a plantation March 31st, 1878, Galveston, Texas. He would eventually stand six foot and a quarter inches. And Jack Johnson was a third of nine children. He was from an ex-slave. And he was a troubled young man. And I can imagine coming up in the time of Jack Johnson, what he have seen, all the lynchings, the hanging of men, who he could and who he could not speak to, what circumstances that he had to overcome, what tracks he couldn't cross. That's a lot of pressure for a young man. Jack Johnson would eventually decide to drop out of school at the age of 16, and he would travel to New York and Boston, Massachusetts. It would be there where Jack Johnson would run into a short, stocky young man with a Caribbean accent. And at that time, that young man's name was the Barbados Wonder. And the Barbados Wonder was very good with his hands. And he can get you into a full Nelson. And somewhat of a figure four leg lock. He was a wrestler. He also knew mixed martial arts. But he was very strong and quick with his hands as well. So he would take in Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson needed a place to stay. And Joe Walcott could provide that service because he was staying at a rooming house. Now, that rooming house was somewhat of a halfway house, delinquent kids, runaways, and so on and so forth. But Jack Johnson didn't know anyone in Boston. And the Barbados wonder took him in. Now, Boston was a place where a lot of young black, either troubled kids or kids who were looking for direction, would land. You would have George Cole and Sam Langford, George Godfrey, George Byers, many of them. And they would get their start from Boston. And Jack Johnson would eventually run into a manager named Morris Hart. And the Barbados wonder, after directing Jack Johnson, showing him how to handle himself with his hands, showing him how to do certain chores that were required for him to stay at the rooming house. And Jack Johnson, his whole motive apparandi at that point was to make money, to live an easier life. So after being introduced to Mars Hart, Jack Johnson, first paycheck was $1.50. He would take on men in the saloons do away with them very quickly. And it would get to a point where he would be introduced to tougher fighters and he would eventually earn $25. He would face his first four-round bout with a man by the name of Bob Thompson. His name was Utah's Bob Thompson. For them April 11th, 1895 in Galveston, Texas. Lost to him in four rounds. Robert Lawrence Thompson. He stood five foot six inches, weighed 133 to 145 pounds.
And this was a new beginning for Jack Johnson. You see, Bob Thompson had experience. He was in a ring with a fighter by the name of Walter McCampbell. Fought him November 11th, 1892. And it would be a three round no decision contest for Bob Thompson. Thompson also faced a fighter by the name of the Montana Kid, Dave Reese. October 26, 1893. And that fight went 15 rounds. Now, all this was new to Jack Johnson. But Jack Johnson didn't stop because he was very strong, very determined, and he knew at one point in time he would defeat most of the guys that would be presented to him. So on May 6, 1899, he would take on a fighter by the name of Klondike John Haynes. Fought him in Chicago. He would lose to him in five rounds. Now, let me tell you something about Klondike Haynes. He stood six foot, he weighed 190 to 210 pounds. He was a black fighter who fought the likes of Frank Charles. Fought him January 7th and February 26th of 1899. On May 27th, 1899, Klondike Haynes was a crafty black middleweight at that time. And his name was Scally Bill Quinn. Fought him May 27th in Chicago. And he stopped in two rounds. Now, why that was important? This man here was something else. He stood five foot eight inches, weighed 145 to 150 pounds. Scally Bill Quinn. I faced Frank Indian Wago, December 15th, 1894 in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And the fight would go 15 rounds and they would call it a draw. Bill Quinn would also take on George Cole for the March 12th and March 23rd of 1895. And at that time, fighting men like that, you can get better and better and better, or you could break, because these men were tough. When they gave you a handshake, it was like a vice grip because of the labor that they were under. Remember, it was tough during that time. They were treated tough. At that time, the black man was considered one fifth of a human being. So when he had a cold or when he had trouble, life experiences. There was no sympathy for him. So he had to endure and tolerate. Couldn't complain. Had to make sure he was tough enough for the next task that was placed upon him. Scowley Bill Quinn would also take on fighters such as Tommy West. For him, March 16th, 1896, and when he fought him, he had to travel up to Long Island. Defeated him in 10 rounds. And Long Island was somewhat of a tougher place for black fighters to live because it had its own area in New York where they had their own little color line. Although that was the north of the Mason-Dixon line, but Long Island has always been known for an area where you stay away from if you look like Jack Johnson. So Bill Quinn would also take on Joe Walcott, the Barbados Demon, May 29, 1896, in Warburn, Massachusetts. He would lose to him in 20 rounds. He would face him again October 12th of 1896, this time in New York. And he would lose to him in 17 rounds. Well, Bill Quinn was a very good fighter, had his moments. He was an opponent of Klondike Haynes. 
Klondike Haynes also faced Sam Langford twice in 1909, July 13th and November 2nd. Fought him in Pittsburgh and also fought him in Boston, Massachusetts. Had a 6 round no decision with him. Six round no decision with him and he would lose to him in two rounds. But Klondike Haynes was a very, very good fighter. And I just wanted to give the accolades to Klondike like Haynes because he faced Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson was a young man during that time. Klondike like Haynes would face Jack Johnson again June 25th, 1900 in Galveston, Texas. It would be a 20-round draw. Faced him again, the excuse me, December 27th, 1900. And this time it would be in Memphis, Tennessee. He would stop him in 14 rounds. Jack Johnson would take on Joe Chowensky. February 25th, 1901. And he would stop Jack Johnson in three rounds. Now, when you look at fighters like Joe Chowensky, this is an old school bare knuckle fighter. And these men were slept on. These men understood how to use their hands, how to handle themselves. Were they fancy? No. Were they strong and durable? Did they know dirty tricks? Yes, they did. And this is how they survived in their time in fisticuffs because they had to know how to take you in deep waters. Jack Johnson was a young man who was strong, felt he had something to prove, and he was relying on his strength not so much technique. He didn't learn that until he met Joe Jowinski. Now, when he was trained by the Barbados Demon, who was the Barbados Wonder at that time, it was more how to handle a man with your strength. It wasn't so much as technique. He didn't learn that until Joe Jowinski. And both these men would wind up going to jail because they were illegally fighting in Galveston, Texas. But while in jail, Jack Johnson learned a, a great deal. He learned a lot about how to use another man's strength and size against him. Jack Johnson always knew how to defend himself, picking off punches and parrying. But he didn't know how to use another man's defense as an offensive weapon for him. He didn't know how to use his legs and move from side to side, move front and back. He didn't understand that until he met Joe Chowinski. That was a blessing in disguise. November 4th and December 27th of 1901, he would face Hank Griffin, old timer Hank Griffin, Bakesfield, California. Lost to him in 20 rounds. Then he would take him on again in Oakland, California, and he would have a 15 round draw. Who was Hank Griffin, by the way? Hank Griffin was a man who weighed about 200 pounds at 219 bouts and stood about six foot two inches. Weighed anywhere between 180 to 215 pounds. Had a manager by the name of Uncle Tom McCary. And Hank Griffin was in there with everyone. Before Jim Jeffries, September 19th, 1895. Los Angeles, California, and he lost to him in 14 rounds. He was in the ring with Frank Childs, April 1893 in Los Angeles, California, and he would go 20 rounds to a draw with him. He would face Black Pearl Harris Martin. He would stop him in four rounds. He was in the ring with Jack Johnson, back to back, November 4th, December 27th. June 20th of 1902 and July 6th of that same year. All draws with one win in 20 rounds. Zane Griffin understood the game of boxing. He'd be in the ring with Jack Johnson more than four occasions. But also take on Denver Ed Martin, October 3rd of 1901. And he would lose to him in seven rounds, Los Angeles, California. 
1903, Jack Johnson started hearing about a young man who came from Canada. He lived in Boston. He was roughhousing a lot of the men and the amateurs. He heard about Sam Langford, who he would meet up with in 1906. But 1903, Sam Langford would take on Joe Gans. It was not for the lightweight championship title because there was a weight disparity. But Jack Johnson himself would take on Denver Ed Martin, February 3rd, 1903, Los Angeles, California. He would defeat him in 20 rounds and he would win the Colored Heavyweight Championship title. February 27th, 1903, Jack Johnson would take on the Oxnard Cyclone, Sam McVeigh, Los Angeles, California, and he would defeat him in 20 rounds. He would take on John Sandy Ferguson, April 16th of 1903. Boston, Massachusetts, in the backyard of Sam Langford. And he would defeat him in 10 rounds. Sam Langford had witnessed that bout. Jack Johnson would take on Joe Butler and Sam McVeigh again. Black Bill, Claude Brooks, fought him February 16, 1904, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It would be a six round no decision contest with Black Bill. But more and more, the name of Sam Langford kept on coming up because now Sam Langford would challenge for the welterweight championship title against Jack Johnson's old roommate, Barbados Demon, Joe Walcott, as he would now be named. But the welterweight championship title was not on the line. And Sam Langford would not be given a victory. It would be considered a draw. And Sam Langford's presence was closer noticed. It, it was more of a problem to a lot of these young men. Men like Jack Root, who would wind up becoming a light heavyweight when he was a middleweight and he was called out by Sam Langford. Jack Root had nowhere to go and his manager, who was a sports writer, promoter, created the light heavyweight division to get Jack Root out of Dodge. And Sam Langford would not be allowed in a tournament that Jack Root and George Gardner would be a part of. Charles Kid McCoy and Marvin Hart would be the two men that George Gardner and Jack Root would have to face in order to face each other for that established title. Sam Langford was not invited, nor was he considered. Jack Johnson will continue traveling all over trying to get fights, taking on Sam McVeigh once again, San Francisco, California, April 22nd, 1904. This time he would stop Sam McVeigh in 20 rounds. October 18th, 1904, Denver Ed Martin, Los Angeles, California. We'll try to take on Jack Johnson once again, but he'd be stopped in two rounds this time. Jack Johnson really understood his role as a heavyweight at this point. 1905, Jack Johnson would take on Marvin Hart. He would lose to Marvin Hart in 20 rounds. San Francisco, California. And that really put a damper on a career of Jack Johnson at that time. Because Marvin Hart, although he somewhat understood the game, he was a pretty decent fighter, but he should not have defeated a Jack Johnson, as you learn on, later on in his career. May 3rd, 1905, Jack Johnson would take on Claude Brooks again, Black Bell in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he would stop him in four rounds. But on May 9th, 1905, Jack Johnson would take on the Iron Man of Hoboken, 
and his name was Joe Jeanette. Fought him in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And that fight will be a three round no decision contest. We fight Joe Jeanette once again on May 19th, 1905. Once again, they would meet up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And this time it will be a six round no decision contest. Jack Johnson would take on Joe Jeanette once again, November 25th. 1905 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he would lose on a foul and two rounds. Joe Jeanette, don't let anybody kid you. One of the toughest fighters that you would ever lay your eyes on. Man who stood five foot ten inches, weighed 185 to 205 pounds. And he was managed by a man by the name of Dan. McKetrick. Joe Jeanette was so good, he would have a street named after him where his house was. Joe Jeanette would be in a ring with fighters such as George Compartier, Sam Langford, Jack Johnson, and Sam McVeigh, George Cole, Big Bill Tate. Very good fighters that Joe Jeanette would be in a ring with. He's not as appreciated as he should be. He'd be entered in the Boxing Hall of Fame in 1967, International Boxing Hall of Fame in 1998. What a great fighter was the Iron Man of Hoboken, Joe Jeanette. On December 1st, 1905, Jack Johnson would take on young Peter Jackson, Sid Thompson, the Baltimore Demon. And it would be a 12 round draw. Young Peter Jackson stood five foot six inches with 148 to 160 pounds. He was managed by Joe Woodman. And he was in there with the likes of mysterious Billy Smith, Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, Sam Langford, Mexican Pete Everett, Joe Butler, the Barbados Demon, Joe Walcott. He would take on fighters that would be willing to challenge him. Men like Bobby Dobbs, who he would lose to in 20 rounds in Memphis, Tennessee, January 22nd to be exact, 1901. Bobby Dobbs himself was a handful. He was a colored lightweight champion who would take on Joe Gans several times. Bobby Dobbs, as we're on the subject of him, he would take on the Montana Cade. He would take on George Kid Lavin. And Kid Ash, the pork chop king. <laughs> Kid Ash stood five foot nine inches, weighed 132. 156 pounds. And he was some fighter. But Bobby Dobbs, very underrated in my opinion. He was also a hell of a fighter. He would take on fighters such as Dan Creedon. Dan Creedon had his fights with a fighter named Frank Craig the Harlem Coffee Cooler. These two men would get it on plenty of times. Dan Creedon would be the European middleweight champion. Bobby Dobbs would mix it up with him. But young Peter Jackson would take on young Griffo and Charlie Turner and Bob Stonewall Allen. He'd be in the ring with the great Jack Johnson. But in 1906, January 16th to be exact, Jack Johnson would find himself once again in the ring with Joe Jeanette, this time in New York. And he would have a three round no decision contest. This was a tough battle between these two men who at this point knew each other pretty well. Now, Jack Johnson would take on Joe Jeanette again in 1906, this time March 14th in Baltimore, Maryland. And he would defeat him in 15 rounds. 
Well, Sam Langford would take on Joe Jeanette also, and he would defeat Joe Jeanette. Two weeks later, Sam Langford would find himself in the ring on April 26, 1906, with the great Jack Johnson in Chelsea, Massachusetts. Jack Johnson would defeat him in 15 rounds. Sam Langford, who I have as number one, greatest fighter of all times, in my opinion, for as a lightweight, although he weighed about 142 pounds in 1903 with Joe Jeanette, with uh, Joe Gans, excuse me. And then in 1904, he would challenge for the welterweight championship title against the Barbados demon Joe Walcott. We're now last 15 rounds with the colored heavyweight champion and soon to be the first black heavyweight champion, Jack Johnson, shows everything you want to know about Sam Langford. And Jack Johnson would never give Sam Langford another opportunity. But Jack Johnson was in, went there with all the toughest fighters of his time. Jim Jeffords. Many, many of them. So I'm scrapbook boxing. We're going to cut it short. I am uh, have a little sore throat, if you will. But I wanted to talk about Jack Johnson. I think Jack Johnson's career needs to be looked at closer. We have to remember, we keep seeming to forget that Jack Johnson came around at a time where he was not appreciated. He was not looked at as equal to anyone else who didn't look like him. I mean, we just have to call it what it is. And for him to survive that way, him to dictate terms and conditions and find a way to deal with the masses, it, it really, it's a story within itself. I mean, he would take on Fireman Jim Flynn, fought him twice, November 2nd, of 1907, Coma, California, 11th round knockout. Fireman Jim Flynn kept on headbutting Jack Johnson to the point where the marshal and the sheriff had to step in, stop the contest. We got to a point like, what is this? Are you serious? Fireman Jim Flynn had knocked out Jack Dempsey in one round, and he was knocked out himself by Sam Langford for seven minutes. Boxing could be misunderstood in every conceivable way. But when you look at fighters like a Jack Johnson and you really start to look into his career quite closely, you can appreciate the man himself much better. As he took on Peter Felix in February 19th, 1907, Sydney, Australia, stopping him in one round. Peter Felix was the cousin of the Black Prince Peter Jackson, who himself was the Australian heavyweight champion and colored heavyweight champion. Black Prince Peter Jackson would stop George Godfrey, Old Chocolate, 19 rounds, and he would win the colored heavyweight championship belt. So thanks for listening. We'll continue this conversation, perhaps on another video. I'm Scrapper Boxing Museum and Forgotten Fisticuff Series. All great fights, all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. Thanks for listening. Peace.